Has God spoken to you recently? Yes. <laughs> this morning, actually. <laughs> Thank you. How, how does God speak to us? Well, people who have been spending their lives studying the Bible tell us that God speaks to us, that is, he reveals himself to us in primarily two ways. He speaks to us through what's called general revelation and through special revelation. Now, those aren't necessarily familiar terms. General revelation simply is that God reveals himself through natural means, means that are available to everybody. And special revelation means that it's unique. It's not in fact, it's supernatural. But let's define that just a little bit further. Uh, general revelation includes God speaking to us through his creation. We talked about that last Sunday, didn't we? He speaks to us through his providence, just the way he works in history. Uh, the rain that God sends on everyone. The Bible says that God's goodness leads us to repentance. And general revelation includes just human nature. God made us in his image. And he gave us a conscience so that anywhere you go in the world, anywhere, in any culture, in any place, in every person, there's this internal compass that says, that's right, or that's wrong. And it's God's revealing himself through general revelation. But God also reveals himself through special revelation. As you can see on the screen, that includes a whole bunch of things. For example, God reveals himself through divine appearances. This is God personally appearing, typically taking on himself a form uh, so that he can be seen. Remember in the Garden of Eden, God walked with Adam and Eve in the cool of the day. And he also speaks to people through direct communication. The prophets often said, the word of the Lord came to me. In other words, God spoke to them in a, a voice that somehow they were able to hear. And then God speaks through visions and dreams. He speaks through angels and prophets. The Bible is full of illustrations of this. He speaks through historical events, supernatural events, like the crossing of the Red Sea. Remember the waters rolled back. The uh, most important way that God reveals himself is through Jesus. Jesus is the perfect revelation of God, the exact replication of who God is. But God also reveals himself supernaturally through the Bible. We're going to talk about that today. Through the church, through the Holy Spirit, through gifted people, people the Holy Spirit uses. And these are available to all people, or not to all people everywhere, but specific situations. Here's an important point. As I understand the Bible, especially in Romans chapter 2, God doesn't judge us for what we don't know. Sometimes people say, well, what if they've never heard about Jesus? I don't believe God judges people on the basis of what they don't know. He judges, on the judges us on the basis of what we did with what we did know. That's why in Romans it says everybody's without excuse because they all see God in creation. And he judges us on the basis of how we respond to what he has already said to us. I'd love to talk about that more, but we better not. Because really today we're going to talk again about Psalm 19. Remember, biggest book of the Bible, if you split your Bible about in half and go a little bit to the left, you'll be in the book of Psalms. And we'll be in poem or song number 19. Psalm 19 is an ancient poem or song written by Israel's King David. And he talks in it about each of those two different ways of God revealing himself. The first half, which we looked at already, is that God speaks to us through his creation. And the second half, which we'll look at this morning, God speaks to us through his word. You might say that God has written two books to us. He's written the book of nature, that's general revelation, and he's written the book of scripture, that's special revelation. Now both of those books, nature and scripture, agree with each other. When you rightly interpret the creation, when science rightly interprets the creation, and when we rightly interpret the Bible, they're never at odds with each other. They're always in perfect harmony. Sometimes they appear to be out of harmony, harmony because either we got science wrong or we got the Bible wrong. They're both God's books. And when they're interpreted correctly, they will always, always agree God is revealing himself. 
Well, last Sunday we looked at the first half of Psalm 19. God speaks to us through his creation. The heavens declare the glory of God, remember? And uh, we concluded that if you'd like to hear God's voice in creation, then you need to open your eyes and ears every day to see God and to hear his voice in the world around you. I won't ask you to raise your hand, but I wonder how many of you noticed God in creation this week? Maybe in the sky, the, sky, the, the sun, the moon, the star. Maybe you're looking at trees or flowers. Maybe you're looking at the birds. Remember we talked about that and how they reveal God. Seeing God in his creation, he speaks to us there. But this morning, we're going to look at the second half of Psalm 19 where we learn that God speaks to us through his word. And let me just read for you the second half of Psalm 19. You can just listen, follow in your Bible if you like, or if you've got your Bible on your telephone and an app, you can follow there. Or as I said, just listen. Psalm 19, beginning at verse 7. The law of the Lord is perfect, refreshing the soul. The statutes of the Lord are trustworthy, making wise the simple. The precepts of the Lord are right, giving joy to the heart. The commands of the Lord are radiant, giving light to the eyes. The fear of the Lord is pure, enduring forever. The decrees of the Lord are firm, and all of them are righteous. They are more precious than gold, than much pure gold. They are sweeter than honey, than honey from the honeycomb. By them your servant is warned. In keeping them there is great reward. But who can discern their own errors? Forgive my hidden faults. Keep your servant also from willful sins. May they not rule over me. Then I will be blameless, innocent of great transgression. May the words of my mouth, this meditation of my heart, be pleasing in your sight, Lord, my rock and my redeemer. Well, David obviously was in awe of the scriptures. And in those verses that I just read, he tells us 18 things about what the Bible is. It's a stunning, passionate description of the scriptures. And we're going to put some, some things up on the screen and move pretty fast through this, uh, though we could probably pause at every one, and we'll say what the Bible is, and then after it, you'll see uh, in red letters the words from the psalm that actually demonstrate it. Well, let's just kind of fly through this. David tells us that the Bible is authoritative. That's the word law. Now, the Hebrew word is Torah, and it refers to the first five books of the Bible. Uh, it's called the Torah, the books of Moses, Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, and Deuteronomy, because that's the Bible that David had. And so it's the law of the Lord, the first five books of the Bible. Now, when we think of a law, we usually think of a rule, don't we? But the Torah was much more than that. Think about Genesis to Deuteronomy. Most of it is stories. It's the, in the history from creation until Israel arrived at the edge of the promised land ready to go in. But it also has poems, it has prophecies, and it has laws. The Ten Commandments, 600 regulations, that's the Torah. And David reminds us that it's authoritative. We live in a lawless culture, don't we? We live in a culture where people don't want anybody telling them what to do. Even some of our politicians think they're above the law. And so David reminds us that this book is authoritative. Secondly, he says the Bible is divine. It's inspired by God. Though it's authored by imperfect men and women, the Holy Spirit guided them so that what we got in this book is trustworthy. And the third thing David says about the Bible is, is that it's flawless. That is, when it's rightly interpreted, the Bible will never be wrong, never lead you astray. The Bible is life-giving. It refreshes the soul. The scriptures refresh, revive, and restore us when we've been beaten down by life, or when perhaps we've been devastated by bad decisions, whether we made them or somebody else did. The Bible is there to restore and refresh us. The scriptures are dependable. They won't deceive you. They won't let you down. You can count on the Bible. It's dependable. 
And David lets us know that the Bible is instructive. He says it makes us wise. They provide knowledge and practical wisdom for life and relationships. He tells us the Bible is uplifting. It gives joy. Sometimes when we're broken by grief or sadness or pain or our own failures, the scriptures will lift us up and give us that contentment and happiness and peace that we long for. David says the Bible is enlightening. Darkness and doubt are dispelled by the scriptures. They shine the light of truth. You might say the Bible turns the light on in your eyes. You ever said about somebody, did you see their eyes light up? You know, they heard or saw something that really made them happy and so their eyes lit up. Well, that's what the scriptures do. They enlighten the eyes. David said the scriptures are durable. In a time when nothing seems permanent, this book is a firm foundation that never changes. You can count on it. David says that the scriptures, the Bible is good. Now we live in a world that's tainted by compromise and evil, but the scriptures always stand for what's right, what's good. David said the Bible is valuable, more precious than gold, lots of gold. Because though we're surrounded by lots of things that are worthless or cheap or trashy or fake, the Bible is never those. It is of inestimable and unchanging value. David says the Bible is satisfying, sweeter than honey. It's like picking out on your favorite food. Uh, that's what the scriptures are. David says the Bible is protective. It warns us against that which would hurt us or destroy us or our relationships. David said the Bible is rewarding. Though God's timetable isn't always the same as mine. Right? You can count on the fact that if you obey the scriptures, God will reward it. Sometimes we see the benefits right away. Sometimes the benefit is delayed. But when we obey the scriptures, it will never be unnoticed by God, and it will always be rewarded. David said the Bible is revealing. The worst kind of deception is self-deception. I'm really good at that, deceiving myself. And there are lots of people who would deceive us, and sometimes we're vulnerable. But the Bible warns us. It reveals to us what is wrong and harmful. David said the Bible is motivational. It promotes prayer. In fact, when he gets to the end of this, he talks about God reveals himself in nature, God reveals himself in scripture, and then he just breaks into prayer. Because ultimately, if I read the Bible right, my response will be that I'll pray. And we'll see that prayer in a few minutes. David says the Bible is transformative. It has the power to set us free from thoughts and words that will hurt us or hurt others. And I love the fact, David says the Bible is personal. He ends it by talking about my rock and my redeemer, because the scripture always leads us into relationship with God. Though the cover is worn, and the pages are torn and both places bear traces of tears. Yet more precious than gold is this book worn and old that can shatter and scatter my fears. When I prayerfully look at this precious old book, as my eyes scan the pages, I see many tokens of love from the Father above who is nearest and dearest to me. This old book is my guide. It's a friend by my side. It will lighten and brighten my way. And each promise I find soothes and gladdens my mind as I read it and heed it each day. To this book I will cling. Of its worth I will sing, though great losses and crosses might be mine, for I cannot despair while surrounded with care, while possessing this blessing divine, the Bible. What an incredible book. But think about this. The Bible David had didn't look like this. The Bible David had was like that. That's all he had, the Torah. 
And yet he was so enthralled with the scriptures that he wrote this song, this poem about the beauty. I mean, what he had was like one bite of a peanut butter and jelly sandwich compared to us having this incredible, massive buffet. It's like sitting down to a, a 10 course steak and chicken and turkey and ham dinner and bacon. We got the whole thing. How much more than David should we be thrilled and excited with this amazing, amazing book? In the midst of that amazing description of what the Bible is, David also talked about what the Bible does. Because this book, the New Testament says, is alive, it's living, it's powerful. And so when you study the Bible, it does something. For example, in verse 7, he lets us know that the Bible refreshes our soul. He says the law of the Lord is perfect, refreshing, restoring, reviving, bringing back the soul. The Bible refreshes your soul. Secondly, what does the Bible do? It makes you wise. In verse 7, he says the statutes of the Lord are trustworthy. They make wise the simple. Sometimes I feel pretty simple. You say, man, I just, I, I, I don't understand that. I don't know anything about that. Or I thought I understood that and I didn't. Well, the scriptures make us wise. Third, he says the Bible gives us joy. Verse 8, the precepts of the Lord are right, giving joy to the heart. I don't know anything better to do when I'm sad than to turn to the scriptures. They give joy. David says that the Bible gives you insight. Verse 8, the commands of the Lord are radiant, giving light to the eyes. How we need that, the ability to see things rightly, to have the right perspective, insight. And then in verse 9, he tells us that the Bible stabilizes our values. The decrees of the Lord are firm, he says in verse 9. As we were leaving home this morning, Gloria had on the computer a sermon by Pastor Phil Byers down in Indiana, a very dear friend. The Pattons know him. He was our music pastor at Calvary way back. <laughs> but he's pastoring in Elkhart now, and as we were leaving, he was talking about the fact that in this day in which we live, it's hard to know what to believe. Because depending on which news channel you listen to, it's green or it's pink, it's right or it's wrong, it's true or it's error, and, and it's just so hard sometimes to sort it all out. Well, the Bible stabilizes your values. If I immerse myself in this book, I'll be able to discern what is right, what is wrong. And in 6, David says the Bible warns us against danger. Verse 11, by then your servant is warned. The seventh thing he says the Bible does is it incentivizes your obedience. He said in keeping these there's great reward. Obedience to God will never be wasted. It's not to say we might not obey God and suffer for it. But in the end, God will always reward and make it worthwhile. The Bible reveals our sin. Do you notice in verse 8, he says, who can discern their own errors? You know, and it's like he's saying, without the scriptures, I can't even see my own faults. I might be able to see the faults of others, you think I can. But without the scripture, I don't see my own faults. They reveal our sin. The Bible also motivates us to pray. That's why this psalm ends in a prayer. You know, if I read the Bible correctly, then my natural response will be to turn to prayer. To say, Lord, help me to believe that. God, help me with my doubts. Lord, help me to behave the way that verse just told me. Lord, help me to stop doing what that verse warned me about. Prayer is a natural response. It's what the Bible does. If I could summarize it, I'd do it this way. The Bible transforms us to be like Christ. That's always the goal of the scriptures. Not to fill my head with knowledge, not so I could be right and somebody else wrong. The Bible is to make us like Jesus. So let me take just a couple of minutes, and I won't spend long here, to say something about how we should read and understand the Bible. This is an amazing book. 
in the key places so simple that a child can understand. And in some places so complicated and deep that scholars have spent their whole